Alright. Yeah. Um Yeah. I thought I'd do this because we did do one, but it was the Piers Morgan and what's his name? And I've got another one I want to do, but it's that guy that was on Piers Morgan arguing with some other guy. Yeah. Uh but I thought I'd do this. This is yeah, it's basically is what it says. A brief, simple history of the conflict between Israel and Palestine. And I find this is a weird thing because, again, this is another thing that's de like, depending on what political party you are, you are either pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. I find it odd to be pro either. Do you know what I mean? It's like... It's a fight that has, well, I suppose it does have something to do with, well, we're going to find out anyway. But I find it just weird that depending on, yeah, if you're left wing, save Palestine. If you're right wing, Israel. Uh, and it, every subject in the world, it's like if you, if you are left wing, you can't have an opinion that doesn't be that, doesn't be pro-Palestine, right? And I see people keep saying pro-Palestine, but they did take people out of their house and execute them. And if someone was to do something, this is why I'm not pro either. Because Israel, like, it's a conflict that goes back years and years and years. However, it's like, if someone come over, well, look what 9-11, look at the war that happened after 9-11. Someone attacked America. And... Everybody went to war for it. Like, and it happens on a smaller scale. If you kick my dog, I'm going to smash you to bitch. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's going to be murders. If you slap my baby, I'm going to slap you. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's going to be murders. It's like, it's just human nature. And I find it weird to say, like, to be pro evil. Really. Like, you'll criticise Israel for the bombs, but then what are you saying? That it's better to take people out and just shoot them and execute them? Like, what, that's better because it's not a bomb and a bomb... It's just weird to me. Like, it's... Do you know what I mean? No one's right. What's the saying? The winner of a war... Uh, um, no, the loser of a war is the first person that comes to their senses. And it's true. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, let's go. One of the biggest myths about the Israel-Palestine conflict is that it's been going on for centuries, all about That's ancient religious said. hatreds. In fact, while religion is involved, conflict's mostly about two groups of people who claim the same land, and it really only goes back about a century to the early 1900s. Around then, the region along the eastern Mediterranean we now call Israel-Palestine, been under Ottoman rule for centuries, was religiously diverse, including mostly Muslims and Christians, also a small number of Jews who lived generally in peace. It was changing in two important ways. First, more people in the region were developing a sense of being not just ethnic Arabs, but Palestinians, a distinct national identity. At the same time, not so far away in Europe, more Jews were joining a movement called Zionism, which said that Judaism was not just a religion, but a nationality, one that deserved a nation of its own. And after centuries of persecution, Many believed a Jewish state was their only way of safety and saw their historic homeland in the Middle East as their best hope for establishing it. In the first decades of the 20th century, tens of thousands of European Jews moved there. After World War I, the Ottoman Empire collapsed and British and French empires carved up the Middle East, the British taking control of a region it called the British Mandate for Palestine. At first, the British allowed Jewish immigration. But as more Jews arrived, settling into farming communities, tension between Jews and Arabs grew. Both sides committed acts of violence, and by the 1930s, the British began limiting Jewish immigration. Again, that's so natural, and it happens on a smaller thing. Say, like, when Indians, come, Indians and Pakistanis come over to our country, or Africans, where do you put them people that come here you don't put them in middle class or upper class areas 
you put them in working class areas where people are already struggling and you all you are is something different we don't know and you're we're now fighting over the same scraps do you know what i mean like we become competitors and it's like the same here of course the arabs is not going to like the fact that these new people is coming over and also if you've been living in europe i do agree that you because Jew is a, it will come up in your DNA. Do you know what I mean? Like if you have Jewish blood, it, there is a DNA that's Jewish. So they are a country, but I, that seems crazy. That why you would want to go from Europe there. It, yeah. In response: Jewish militias formed to fight both the local Arabs and to resist British rule. Then came the Holocaust, leading many more Jews to flee Europe for British Palestine and galvanizing much of the world in support of a Jewish state. In 1947, as sectarian violence between Jews and Arabs there grew, the United Nations approved a plan to divide British Palestine into two separate states, one for Jews, Israel, and one for Arabs, Palestine. The city of Jerusalem, where Jews, Muslims, and Christians all have holy sites, was to become a special international zone. The plan was meant to give Jews a state, to establish Palestinian independence and to end the sectarian violence that the British could no longer control. But the Jews accepted the plan and they declared independence as Israel. But Arabs throughout the region saw the UN plan as just more European colonialism trying to steal their land. Many of the Arab states, who had just recently won independence themselves, declared war on Israel in an effort to establish a unified Arab Palestine where all of British Palestine had been. The new state of Israel won the war, but in the process, they pushed well past their borders under the UN plan, taking the western half of Jerusalem and much of the land that was to have been part of Palestine. They also expelled huge numbers of Palestinians from... Again, apply that to gangs in the streets. If my gang and your gang goes to war, I'd beat your gang and then, yeah, I'd take your territory. Especially if you started it. Do you know what I mean? The Arabs started that war, even if you want to say that they shouldn't have been there in the first place, which I'll give you. But the person that started attacking was the Arabs and they declared war on Israel. Israel won, then yeah, that's just life. That happens in anything. Like, if a champion boxer loses to the contender, they take, he takes the belt. Like... <clears throat> creating a massive refugee population whose descendants today number about 7 million. At the end of the war, Israel controlled all of the territory except for Gaza, which Egypt controlled, and the West Bank, named because it's west of the Love Jordan Egypt. River, which Jordan controlled. This was the beginning of the decades-long Arab-Israeli conflict. During this period, many Jews in Arab-majority countries fled or were expelled, arriving in Israel. Then something happened that transformed the conflict. In 1967, Israel and the neighboring Arab states fought another war. Six day when war. it ended, Israel had seized the Golan Heights from Syria, the West Bank from Jordan, and both Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt. Israel was now occupying the Palestinian territories, including all of Jerusalem and its holy sites. This left Israel responsible for governing the Palestinians, a people it had fought for decades. In 1978, Israel and Egypt signed the U.S.-brokered Camp David Accords. Shortly after that, Israel gave Sinai back to Egypt as part of the peace treaty. At the time, this was hugely controversial in the Arab world. Egyptian President Anwar Sadat was assassinated in part because of outrage against it. But it marked the beginning of the end of the wider Arab-Israeli conflict. Over the next few decades, the other Arab states gradually made peace with Israel, even if they never signed formal peace treaties. But Israel's military was still occupying the Palestinian territories of the West Bank and Gaza. And this is when the conflict became an Israeli-Palestinian struggle. The Palestinian Liberation Organization, which had formed in the 1960s to seek a Palestinian state, fought against Israel, including through acts of terrorism. Initially, the PLO claimed all of what had been British Palestine, meaning it wanted to end the state of Israel entirely. Fighting between Israel and the PLO went on for years even including a 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon to kick the group out the of The stillness of the ceasefire in southern Lebanon was shattered today by the sound of guns, bombs, and planes. 
Now, the PLO later said it would accept dividing the land between Israel and Palestine, but the conflict continued. As all of this was happening, something dramatic was changing in the Israel-occupied Palestinian territories. Israelis were moving in. These people are called settlers, and they made their homes in the West Bank and Gaza, whether Palestinians wanted them or not. Some moved for religious reasons, some because they want to claim the land for Israel, some just because housing is cheap, and often subsidized by the Israeli government. Some settlements are cities with thousands of people, others are small communities deep into the West Bank. If you've always felt a deep yearning for Jerusalem, now is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity not only to stand within its gates, but also to build the home of your dreams there. The settlers are followed by soldiers to guard them, and the growing settlements force Palestinians off of their land and divide communities. Short term, they make the occupation much more painful for Palestinians. Long term, by dividing up Palestinian land, they make it much more difficult for the Palestinians to ever have an independent state. Mm -hmm. Today, there are several hundred thousand settlers in occupied territory, even though the international community considers them illegal. By the late 1980s, Palestinian frustration exploded into the Intifada, which is the Arabic word for uprising. It began with mostly protests and boycotts, but soon became violent. Israel responded with heavy force. A couple hundred Israelis, over a thousand Palestinians died in the first Intifada. See, Around the really, same time, a group of See, really, Israel, when they was all kind of happy with each other, Israel should have just given back their land and gone back to where they were given it initially and just said, like, Israel's obviously the superior power, but they should have just said, look, listen, we'll give you back that land, make that Palestine, but if you take any type of liberties, we're taking all of it. Like, that would have ended the whole thing right there and then. Palestinians in Gaza considered the PLO too secular, too compromise-minded, created Hamas, a violent extremist group dedicated to Israel's destruction. By the early 1990s, it's clear that Israelis and Palestinians have to make peace. The leaders from both sides signed the Oslo Accords. This is meant to be the big first step toward Israel maybe someday withdrawing from the Palestinian territories and allowing an independent Palestine. The Oslo Accords established the Palestinian Authority, allowing Palestinians a little bit of freedom to govern themselves in certain areas. Hardliners on both sides opposed the Oslo Accords. Members of Hamas launched suicide bombings to try to sabotage the process. The Israeli right protest peace talks with ralliers calling Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin a traitor and a Nazi. Not long after Rabin signs the second round of Oslo Accords, a far-right Israeli shoots him to death in Tel Aviv. But this violence showed how extremists on both sides can use violence to derail peace, keep a permanent conflict going as they seek the other side's total destruction. That's a dynamic that's been around ever since. Negotiations meant to hammer out the final details on peace drag on for years, and a big Camp David summit in 2000 comes up empty. Palestinians come to believe peace isn't coming, rise up in a second intifada, this one much more violent than the first. By the time it wound down a few years later, about a thousand Israelis and 3,200 Palestinians had died. But the second intifada really changes the conflict. Israelis become much more skeptical that Palestinians will ever accept peace or that it's even worth trying. Israeli politics shift right, the country builds walls and checkpoints to control Palestinians' movements. They're not really trying to solve the conflict anymore, just to manage it. The Palestinians are left feeling like negotiating didn't work, and violence didn't work, and that they're stuck under an ever-growing occupation with no future as a people. That year, Israel withdraws. That's kind of weird of Israel to say, doesn't seem like Palestinian, Palestine wants peace. It's like, well, no, because you've got their shit. I can fully understand that. I can fully, to be honest, I can understand both sides. Israel took it because they could and unfortunately that's the way of the world do you know what i mean um they took it but they should have just yeah they should have just give it back and said 
if this will cause peace, but then to turn around and say, well, it's clear Palestine's never going to have peace. It's like, well, no, because they've tried everything to get their own state back, but you won't let them have it. Like, there's a legit reason for them to be fuming. But then, on the other hand, like I say, you go in people's houses, start doing crazy stuff. Didn't they kill 3,000 people in a day or something? Israel now, like, you forced that, you forced Israel's hand that now they have to. Do you know what I mean? And I don't, although it's terrible that, yeah, children are dying and that, but you can see why, if it was our country and our people, we'd want a retaliation too. But, yeah, it's kind of like a street gangs where literally they go back and forth fighting and fighting over one incident and it would just but then it's not one incident because you killed my friend now i killed your friend now you hate me i hate you we just keep going and going and going until everyone's dead hamas gains power but splits from the palestinian authority in a short civil war dividing gaza from the west bank israel puts gaza under a suffocating blockade and unemployment rises to 40 percent this is the state of the conflict as we know it today. It's relatively new and it's unbearable for Palestinians. In the West Bank, more and more settlements are smothering Palestinians, often respond with protests and sometimes with violence, though most just want normal lives. In Gaza, Hamas and other violent groups have periodic wars with Israel. The fighting overwhelmingly kills Palestinians, including lots of civilians. In Israel itself, most people have become apathetic. For the most part, the occupation keeps the conflict relatively removed from their daily lives, with moments of brief but horrible violence. There's little political will for peace. No one really knows where the conflict goes from here. Maybe a third intifada, maybe the Palestinian Authority collapses. But everyone agrees that things as they are now can't last much longer. Israel's occupation of the Palestinians is too unstable to last, and that unless something dramatic changes, whatever comes next will be much worse. Yeah. Yeah, like I say, I can see both sides. Like, I can understand. I never really got why they gave the Jews that area in the first place, but like, what the Jews say is true. They are their own race. Do you know what I mean? They are people and they do deserve. And I'm guessing that they have, yeah, they, he said they have some historical home there. <clears throat> so that's fair enough. But, and then the people there you started beefing with, you took a bit of their land. Really, Israel could just stop it all by just giving them their land. Do you know what I mean? Like, it does seem that that's the fastest route to peace. Because, like I say, I can understand that, yeah, they attacked you, you beat them, and you took their shit. That's life. But, do you know what I mean? There comes a point where you kind of have to... It's like arguing with your neighbours. If you have neighbours that you're constantly at war with like that, like, who needs that every day? You're right next to each other. But but then that's how beefs always are. Do you know what I mean? People always beef the people right next to them. It's, again, that's life. Like, it just is. But if I was Prime Minister of this country... I'd just go to Israel and say, look, give them their land back and well, you just need to negotiate on that. Do you know what I mean? Like, because Palestine, like, if Israel wanted to go back there in the first place at to have their own land and surely they can understand what where Palestine is coming from in that anyway because now they're doing the same thing to Palestine they've taken them from their homes and they don't have a land no more it's like 
well, then what do we do? Put them somewhere else so another group can beef the Palestinians. So, yeah, it's kind of... Um... The other thing as well, yeah, is Arabs are actually the most friendliest people. So to get people like that to be like that, yeah, you've got to do some serious shit. They are. They're the most welcoming and, do you know what I mean? Like, they'll give you anything if they like you. But I suppose they're going to beef you if they don't. But, yeah. Yeah. The only way that there can be beef is if Israel is somehow brought to the table and somehow convinced to give that land up. Um, but then on the other hand, I can understand why they don't too. Do you know what I mean? You killed, and especially now you slaughtered our people in giving it back now. Like, it's like our royal family has a thing that if any of them get kidnapped, the country won't negotiate. Do you know what I mean? Because if that's the case, then every country around the world, every time they want us to do something, they just kidnap our royal family. So you just get sacrificed for the greater good. But, um, yeah. I don't know. But I'd say that's the only way that you're going to actually even come close to a peace. And to be honest, it just looks like Palestine's going to get smashed. Like, Especially now. It's like you've done that. Yeah, you're going to lose. And now we've started bombing them as well, haven't we? But then that was because they kept doing aggression things with us, didn't they? Flying drones over or saying We shot down six drones or saying And basically said, you do that again. Just be murders. Again, I don't know why we're there anyway. Again, just get involved in something that we ain't got no business being in. We washed our hands with it years ago, but yeah, somehow we're still hanging around the edge. Do you know what I mean? Either get in, that's what I was saying in the Cap Williams thing I did. You either get involved or completely come out. You're either completely in or you're completely out. Anything else is just dangerous. But yeah, anyway, let me know your thoughts. That's the reactions. Oh.